strong. Welcome to Learning English from the Voice of America. I'm Katie Reber. Our 30-minute program is designed for people learning English. Today on the show, we have reports from Ashley Thompson and Jonathan Evans. And we close with American Stories. Today, we hear the second and final part of Rappaccini's Daughter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Here's Ashley Thompson. A group of young people are dancing in public in Afghanistan's capital, Kabul. The women and men perform a Sufi Islamic dance known as Sema. The group's members hope that dancing in mixed groups changes expectations about gender in the deeply conservative country. Fahima Mirzai is the group's founder. She is 24 years old and works as an economist. I just want to express myself and my feelings with Sema dance, Mirzai said. Mirzai recently danced alongside male members of her group at a cultural event held at an Italian restaurant in central Kabul. That night, she was the only woman from her group dancing, although other women watched and read poems. As she spins in circles, one hand reaches toward the sky and the other toward the earth. Her white clothes are flowing in a familiar image seen across the Middle East and Central Asia. Dancers spin repetitively in prayer as they say Allah's name and gain speed. They seek to lose themselves in a spiritual state that they believe brings them close to God. But Afghanistan is not widely accepting of the activity. The powerful Taliban political group rejects Sufism, dancing, and singing. Many Afghan women worry about a return of Taliban rule as part of a future peace deal. They remember the years of oppression under a severe form of Islamic law. But even in today's Afghanistan, most people consider women and men dancing together in public to be a violation of the country's culture, traditions, and religious beliefs. Mirzai's dance group brings men and women together to perform in public. Most of the members are Shiite Muslims. They are a minority in Afghanistan that has been targeted for attacks by the Islamic State group. The militant group considers Shiites, including Sufis, to be anti-Islam. Mirzai says she does not think about what people may say about her dancing. She is part of a generation that has grown up during Afghanistan's latest war. She remains concerned about the violence in her country. She hopes she can change that through Sufism and the written works of Rumi, possibly the most well-known Sufi. Her group has also used Sufi dance to help them get through the coronavirus crisis. During a lockdown earlier this year, Mirzai closed her center and provided training to her students online. Now she is back dancing in person. At the Italian restaurant, Abdul Ahad, a civil rights activist, said he had been to a few private Sufi events in Afghanistan. But this was the first time he had seen a woman doing the dance. Mirzai's father, her sister, and her mother are among her few supporters. But they also worry. Her mother, Kamar, says she stays awake at night waiting until Mirzai returns home after dancing. There's no security and girls are taunted on their way out to work, she said. Mirzai said she cannot live by someone else's rules. 
She said she does not plan to stop performing. I never asked anyone's permission for starting it, and I will not need anyone's permission to end it. So I will never stop or surrender to anyone, she said. I'm Ashley Thompson. Kataza had a long record of criminal activity with Cape Town officials. So, when he organized a group of others to raid several homes outside the city, he was captured. Now he sleeps at a local prison. But there is a strong social media campaign that calls for his return. Kataza is a baboon. He is one of a few hundred urban baboons who live around Cape Town. Normally, they live in the mountains that surround the city, but often they will come into town to look for food. There are around 15 troops in the greater Cape Town area which number about 500 baboons, say local experts. Kataza operated in the seaside village of Komaki in southern Cape Town. After he was captured, rangers took him to the nearby area of Tukai. They hoped that he would become part of another, better-behaved troop and stop his troublemaking. Activists, however, want him to be taken home and reunited with his own troop. Hashtag Bring Back Kataza reads a sign posted by a road in Komaki. There's a Facebook page calling for his safe return. Kataza was unfairly singled out, said Jenny Trethewin. She runs Baboon Matters a conservation organization in Cape Town that seeks ways for humans and baboons to peacefully coexist. She wants him back in Komaki. Trethewin has spent many days observing Kataza since he was moved late last month. She said he has not joined the Tokai troop, is alone, and appears to be unhappy. He now spends his days wandering through the streets and his nights sleeping in the yard of a local prison. Officials keep what they call rap sheets that list a baboon's bad acts and Kataza's was apparently extensive. Officials decided to act after he led his troop on 15 raids through Komaki in July and August, they said. Trethewin said, The city is just blaming baboons for being baboons. Baboons are criminalized for things that baboons do normally, Trethewin added. I'm Jonathan Evans. An extremely small Rubik's Cube has gone on sale in Japan for 198,000 yen, or about $1,900. Advertised as a super small Rubik's Cube, it was created to mark the 40th anniversary of the box-shaped puzzle in Japan. The cube measures just 9.9 millimeters by 9.9 millimeters and weighs 2 grams. The puzzle is made of metal and comes with a box for its display, says Mega House Corporation, 
a business of Japan's Bandai Company. The Rubik's Cube is very small, but playable. People can buy it now and expect shipment beginning in December. Erno Rubik of Hungary invented the Rubik's Cube in the 1970s. At the time, he was an architecture professor. An American company, Ideal Toys, turned the puzzle into a hit product in the 1980s. It was an immediate hit in Japan, where more than 4 million were sold in the first eight months after it went on sale in July 1980. By 1982, more than 100 million Rubik's Cubes were sold worldwide. The new tiny cube was shown this week at an exhibit in Tokyo, organized by the Hungarian Embassy. The exhibit also includes an artwork made with Rubik's Cubes. The show ends on November 9th. Norbert Palanovics, the Hungarian ambassador to Japan, said he tells anyone who will listen about the Rubik's Cube. He said it represents the small, simple, but intelligent qualities of the country that he is so proud of. The Rubik's Cube is part of our everyday life, here in Japan, too, and inspires everyone, he said. Today, we answer a question from Tu Hung. Tu Hung writes, I am confused when using the words let and leave. Please tell me more about them. Thank you. Dear Tu Hung, thank you for writing to us. These two words may seem similar, but they have different uses. Let us look at them. You hear it often in everyday language. In one famous song, the Beatles sing, Let it be. There, it means to relax and not worry too much about your life. At other times, you may hear, Leave her be, as in this example. The cat is not happy about visitors. Please leave her be. Let it her or him be, and leave it her or him be, mean about the same thing. That is, you should permit the cat to remain where she is, and not try to touch her. Let commonly means to permit someone or something to do something. Here are a few examples. Let me help you if you need it. The teacher lets us take a five-minute break during class. It is good to let your dog go outside for half an hour each day. Let's, a shortened form of let us, is commonly used for making a suggestion to another person or a group of people. Here are two examples. Let's sit under a big tree so we won't get sunburned. Let's tell Andrew to buy some fish for a meal. Let us is more rarely used. It can communicate more like a command than a suggestion. For example, during a religious service, the clergy leader might say, Let us pray, meaning, Now we will pray. Let us also might be used when the speaker wants to add weight to a request, like in this sentence. Please let us get a dog, Mom. The negative way of saying this is let's not or let us not. For example, 
Let's not go to a movie today. It is too nice outside. Leave usually means to go away from a place or person. For example, we left the park early this afternoon. I left my friends after the party so I could go home. Leave can also mean to give up or stop having a job or position. For example, the mayor will be leaving office in a month. Finally, leave also means to let something remain as it is. This is the closest definition of leave to let, but they are not quite the same. Here are some examples. After the car accident, I left my car as it was for a few months before I got it fixed. Painting your room? Leave the color choice to me. I hope that helps to answer your question, Chu Hung. And that's Ask a Teacher. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. I'm Jill Robbins. And I'm Gregory Stockel. Today we complete the story Rappaccini's Daughter. It was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Here is Kay Galland with the second and final part of Rappaccini's Daughter. Many years ago, a young man named Giovanni Guasconti left his home in Naples to study in northern Italy. He took a room in an old house next to a magnificent garden filled with strange flowers and other plants. The garden belonged to a doctor, Giacomo Rappaccini. He lived with his daughter Beatrice in a small brown house in the garden. From a window in his room, Giovanni had seen that Rappaccini's daughter was very beautiful. But everyone in Padua was afraid of her father. Pietro Baglioni, a professor at the university, warned Giovanni about the mysterious Dr. Rappaccini. He is a great scientist, Professor Baglioni told the young man, but he is also dangerous. Rappaccini cares more about science than he does about people. He has created many terrible poisons from the plants in his garden. One day, Giovanni found a secret entrance to Rappaccini's garden. He went in. The plants all seemed wild and unnatural. Giovanni realized that Rappaccini must have created these strange and terrible flowers through his experiments. Suddenly, Rappaccini's daughter came into the garden. She moved quickly among the flowers until she reached him. Giovanni apologized for coming into the garden without an invitation, but Beatrice smiled at him and made him feel welcome. I see you love flowers, she said, and so you have come to take a closer look at my father's rare collection. While she spoke, Giovanni noticed a perfume in the air around her. He wasn't sure if this wonderful smell came from the flowers or from her breath. She asked him about his home and his family. She told him she had spent her life in this garden. Giovanni felt as if he were talking to a very small child. Her spirit sparkled like clear water. They walked slowly through the garden as they talked. At last, they reached a beautiful plant that was covered with large purple flowers. He realized 
that the perfume from those flowers was like the perfume of Beatrice's breath, but much stronger. The young man reached out to break off one of the purple flowers, but Beatrice gave a scream that went through his heart like a knife. She caught his hand and pulled it away from the plant with all her strength. Don't ever touch those flowers, she cried. They will take your life. Hiding her face, she ran into the house. Then Giovanni saw Dr. Rappuccini standing in the garden. That night, Giovanni could not stop thinking about how sweet and beautiful Beatrice was. Finally, he fell asleep. But when the morning came, he woke up in great pain. He felt as if one of his hands was on fire. It was the hand that Beatrice had grabbed in hers when he had reached for one of the purple flowers. Giovanni looked down at his hand. There was a purple mark on it that looked like four small fingers and a little thumb. But because his heart was full of Beatrice, Giovanni forgot about the pain in his hand. He began to meet her in the garden every day. At last, she told him that she loved him, but she would never let him kiss her or even hold her hand. One morning, several weeks later, Professor Baglioni visited Giovanni. I was worried about you, the older man said. You have not come to your classes at the university for more than a month. Is something wrong? Giovanni was not pleased to see his old friend. No, nothing is wrong. I am fine, thank you. He wanted Professor Barlioni to leave, but the old man took off his hat and sat down. My dear Giovanni, he said, you must stay away from Rappuccini and his daughter. Her father has given her poison from the time she was a baby. The poison is in her blood and on her breath. If Rappuccini did this to his own daughter, what is he planning to do to you? Giovanni covered his face with his hands. Oh, my God, he cried. Don't worry, the old man continued. It is not too late to save you and we may succeed in helping Beatrice, too. Do you see this little silver bottle? It holds a medicine that will destroy even the most powerful poison. Give it to your Beatrice to drink. Professor Baglioni put the little bottle on the table and left Giovanni's room. The young man wanted to believe that Beatrice was a sweet and innocent girl. And yet, Professor Baglioni's words had put doubts in his heart. It was nearly time for his daily meeting with Beatrice. As Giovanni combed his hair, he looked at himself in a mirror near his bed. He could not help noticing how handsome he was. His eyes looked particularly bright, and his face had a healthy, warm glow. He said to himself, At least her poison has not gotten into my body yet. As he spoke, he happened to look at some flowers he had just bought that morning. A shock of horror went through his body. The flowers were turning brown. Giovanni's face became very white as he stared at himself in the mirror. Then he noticed a spider crawling near his window. He bent over the insect 
and blew a breath of air at it. The spider trembled and fell dead. I am cursed, Giovanni whispered to himself. My own breath is poison. At that moment, a rich, sweet voice came floating up from the garden. Giovanni, you are late. Come down. You are a monster, Giovanni shouted as soon as he reached her. And with your poison you have made me into a monster too. I am a prisoner of this garden. Giovanni, Beatrice cried, looking at him with her large bright eyes. Why are you saying these terrible things? It is true that I can never leave this garden, but you are free to go wherever you wish. Giovanni looked at her with hate in his eyes. Don't pretend that you don't know what you've done to me. A group of insects had flown into the garden. They came toward Giovanni and flew around his head. He blew his breath at them. The insects fell to the ground dead. Beatrice screamed, I see it! I see it! My father's science has done this to us. Believe me, Giovanni, I did not ask him to do this to you. I only wanted to love you. Giovanni's anger changed to sadness. Then he remembered the medicine that Professor Baglioni had given him. Perhaps the medicine would destroy the poison in their bodies and help them to become normal again. Dear Beatrice, he said, our fate is not so terrible. He showed her the little silver bottle and told her what the medicine inside it might do. I will drink first, she said. You must wait to see what happens to me before you drink it. She put Baglioni's medicine to her lips and took a small sip. At the same moment, Rappuccini came out of his house and walked slowly toward the two young people. He spread his hands out to them as if he were giving them a blessing. My daughter, he said, you are no longer alone in the world. Give Giovanni one of the purple flowers from your favorite plant. It will not hurt him now. My science and your love have made him different from ordinary men. My father, Beatrice said weakly, why did you do this terrible thing to your own child? Rappuccini looked surprised. What do you mean, my daughter? he asked. You have power no other woman has. You can defeat your strongest enemy with only a breath. Would you rather be a weak woman? I want to be loved, not feared, Beatrice replied. But now it does not matter. I am leaving you, father. I am going where the poison you have given me will do no harm. Goodbye to you, Giovanni. Beatrice dropped to the ground. She died at the feet of her father and Giovanni. The poison had been too much a part of the young woman. The medicine that destroyed the poison destroyed her as well.